I have tried to find a way to concisely introduce today's guest, and the best I can come up with is admitting that I cannot find a way to concisely introduce today's guest. He is a man who has lived a life so full of variety that there is no way to sum it up. It is also the case that English is not his first language, and he has retained a moderately strong accent from his homeland. So I debated putting up subtitles so you could understand him better, but I think if you just pay attention to what he has to say and listen closely, you'll catch it. He would be fascinating to listen to with any accent. I'm Brian Johnson, and this is Nobody You Know. Hello and welcome to Nobody You Know. I'm here today with Fred Hosilios of Prineville, Oregon. And I met Fred at a a variety show that Prineville hosted as a fundraiser. And he struck me instantly as somebody potentially interesting. For one primary reason. um, Well, two reasons, I guess. Um, One, he's part of, with all due respect, the older generation. Um, And I think there is a lot that can be learned. I think the younger generation makes a big mistake when they just ignore the experiences and history of those who have come before. And the other is that he is not uh, a native-born American. You are an immigrant to America. That is correct. From the Philippines. That is correct. Okay. And so in the very brief conversation we had at this variety show, I said, I want to know more. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. So welcome to Nobody You Know. And let's just start right out with... um, your early life, being born in the Philippines, and, and kind of what it was like living there. I, we had a very brief conversation beforehand, so everything he's about to tell me, I haven't heard. <laughs> I was born in the Philippines in a very historic date for the whole world. Pearl Harbor was bombed. You were born that day? I was born a year and five months before Oh, okay. Pearl Harbor was bombed. Mm-hmm. And after Pearl Harbor was bombed the following day, the enemies of our nation, they invaded the Philippines where there were three or four uh, uh, military bases. Mm -hmm. So it was a very attractive target for them. So here I was a year and five months after I was born. All I did remember is been when the enemy came, we had to run for our lives. In the Philippines, who was the enemy? Was that still the Japanese? Yes. Okay. Were the Philippines? I know. I know almost nothing about the Philippines. Were they allied with the with Britain and America, or the Philippines at the time was a colony of the United States? Okay. So, because of that, they had established a lot of military uh, bases. They had a Air Force, they had the Navy, they had the Army, and uh, this was a wonderful opportunity for the enemy to target because they wanted to take over the reign of uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And so that is why they were there for about four years. Before we went on camera, you mentioned a dictator over the Philippines, uh, Mr. Marcos. In that fact. is correct. Okay. When did when did that happen? This happened uh, uh, shortly before the 1960s. Okay. Uh, he was elected to a first term, wanted a second term, but after the second term expired, he declared martial law because he didn't want to leave the White House. Our White House is called Malacanang palace the palace that is called Malacañang. How, how long was he dictator of the philippines because i know that name so i mean that then that would have been the 1980s when i was a kid and we were all joking about imelda marcos's thousand pairs of shoes yes but, <laughs> yes how long was how long was he dominating the philippines he dominated the philippines i think no less than 10 years and uh the last vestiges of his uh, reign is in the, you're right, 1980s. He was driven off the palace by a independently done election, and he lost, mm-hmm. and he did not want to leave. 
But then the United States at the time said, it's time for you to go. And in the middle of the night, he was spirited from the Philippines by the U.S. Air Force and was taken to Honolulu. Okay. That was now 1986. 1986. Okay. You showed me a photo that led to a conversation about basically meeting the woman who would become your wife, but it started with another woman. (laughs) Who was somebody's wife. Who was somebody else's (laughs) wife. (laughs) So what's the story behind this one? The lady on the right was the very first Filipina to become Miss International. Coincidentally, that was the first time they had a Miss International. And the first winner was a Filipina. Her name was Gemma Cruz, coming from a very ancient family of Spanish lineages. I was not the picture, but I was the one who invited Gemma Cruz and her husband to come to the Philippines because at this time, the young people of the Philippines were so much into nationalism. Mm -hmm. And Gemma Cruz and her husband were real nationalists. Now, unknowingly to me, you know, my job was just to schedule their visit from one university to another. You uh, were a, you were a university student at the time. Yes, okay. I was a working student. Mm-hmm. So when we went there to the University of Iloilo, I didn't realize I've never seen this woman before. I, in fact, I saw this only when we got married. <laughs> but I was somewhere else taking care of the next scheduled. Uh, school visit right but I was in the same place and lo and behold after we got married she showed it to me I said doggone it how did it happen so that's my wife Rochelle mm-hmm. yes she was so at a- so at the time you didn't even know her no so you no. invited Miss International mm-hmm. and her husband and her husband yeah and your future wife mm-hmm. did what she did put the lay on them. Okay. Yes. Is this a ceremonial, like a greeting, the putting of yes, the lay on? Yes, okay. you know, it's, it's very Filipino. I hear it happens in Hawaii for tourists, but I didn't know how traditional do, that was. We okay. do that because they're special guests. Okay. So if you came there and I told them that you're my guest, they will give you a lay. Okay. So be sure you let me know. I will, I will make sure when I, if I ever <laughs> land in Hawaii, I say, Fred sent me. <laughs> so this was in the Philippines. And uh, it was, I think, about three years later that we met. Okay. And you actually have the photo. This photo is you... In introducing Jim Cruz. Say, I was then part of a student activism in the Philippines. Okay. And that meant inviting people of national stature who would help us in our cause to bring back Philippine nationalism. And that's what I did. I had organized a dinner, invited her and her husband, and so she spoke in that in that uh, dinner. Okay, bring back Filipino nationalism. What exactly do you mean by that? Were the as in, I mean, yeah. What you tell me? What you mean? At this time, uh, there was so much. uh, outcry about the fact that the flavor of the national citizens of the country where we're living have been subverted by foreign powers. Okay. That is really the reason for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But there were two types of people who were activists. There were people who took arms, went to the mountains, and fought. And there were people like me who just wanted to inculcate in the mind of the students what nationalism is Mm -hmm. without being uh, taking any kind of arms. Mm -hmm. But even then, uh, for us who advocated just a peaceful change, uh, we were actually sort of lumped with the people who took arms. Mm. So there was a time when I could not leave the Philippines because I was marked. Hmm, okay. So at this time, in, in in your position, you were trying to peacefully restore a Filipino life and culture free from the influences of just all the foreign 
Yes. Foreign people coming in, that, foreign that, powers, that, foreign... Okay. That is accurate. Make sure... Okay. Making sure I got that. Good. I, I am sitting next to someone that might be almost too famous to be on Nobody You Know, and I just didn't know it. So you, you've been written up in the LA Times. Yes. Um, go ahead and, and tell us what the Marathon Clinic is about. I've also been written up in the uh, the Band Bulletin, okay. mm -hmm. the Central Oregonian, mm -hmm. several times. The church who sponsored me could not give me any licensed job like a pastor because I didn't go to a seminary. Mm -hmm. But then at the time, their custodian was retiring. When the pastor saw the crowd who came to the clinic, one Sunday they came and they saw the crowd that came to the clinic. They were amazed and they said, we are flabbergasted that we cannot give him a decent job. But then they said, Fred, would you be willing to take the job of a custodian janitor? Um, and I said, what will you pay me? Will you build a free house? We pay for your children's education, 70% of their tuition, we'll pay for that in the private school. We'll pay for your health insurance and uh, we'll give you benefits. We'll even have a IRA for you. I said, hey, that's not bad. So then my job title is Fred Johnny. <laughs> oh, what's Fred Johnny? I said, Fred the janitor. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I did that for three years. Three years until the new pastor said, we cannot do this to this man. Look at the people who come every Sunday to his clinic. Not only that, but this younger pastor who came from New Zealand said, I have always trained to do a marathon every time I go to the higher uh, mileage, I get injured. I said, you come and train with me. So they asked me to divorce the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and then they ordained me, ordained me, they created a pastoral position. The regional office will not ordain me because I didn't go to a seminary. Mm -hmm. But what what church? It was the Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. It's a huge church mm -hmm. in LA. They had a 500 bed hospital. And so they ordained me and they said from now on you will be a full-time pastor for health ministry. And that's what I did. And then three years later, there was a change in senior pastor. I was not popular with that man, so we split ways. But there was a wealthy woman for whom my younger sister was working, who learned about what I've been doing. So she said, I'll hire you. I'll hire you as my assistant. After she hired me and said, this is what we'll pay you, she said, I'll do even better. I'll pay you and I will train you to be a nursing home administrator. For one year, you'll be paid you'll be trained. Mm -hmm. So to make a little story short, after very uh, trying times because my brain was getting older, I did pass my state and my federal examination to be a nursing home administrator. Hmm. And uh, the people I work with were very happy when I left. That's one of the best. Now, you might want to rephrase that. It's not they were happy happy when you left. They were pleased with your work. <laughs> they, were pleased, uh, they were pleased with the Yes, no, they were pleased with my, my work. Were you an athlete when you were in never, college? Or, no? Never, okay. never. But as an involved part of the church I was part of, I learned early on that whatever we know how to do, we should share it. Okay. With everyone. I was not a runner. I, I, in fact, the week before I started this running clinic in my hometown, I thought I was well healthy enough. I was then 42. Okay. And I said, okay, let's race on the beach. 
Oh my goodness. I fainted. <laughs> my wife said, mm mm mm. So, anyway, Dr. John Wagner, a cardiologist from Honolulu, he was then visiting the Philippines because he belonged to the same denomination. And they were taking, a, uh, they were using his exper- expertise as a cardiologist. So, in the meantime, I was also very antsy to start something special in my hometown. It's a big town, about half a million people. Okay. So, uh, a common friend, an editor of a, you know, of a church publishing, and I have known each other, and I told him my desire to start something unique. So, he told Dr. Wagner, and he connected, and he said, I'll spend the weekend with you, July 4, 1982. How can I forget that? So he came, I gathered some people who were willing to learn, but at the same time who will be my uh, guinea pig. So because I will I will train with them, but when Dr. Wagner is back in, 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 in Manila, I'll carry on for 12 weeks. And you've continued doing that um, you had a, an article from a local paper. You you used that right on through last uh, summer. Last summer, oh yes, to to get people who had been cooped up in their houses, yes, um, believing that they just couldn't go anywhere safely. Uh, yes. it, you know that's that's a recipe for deteriorating health. Yes, kick the pandemic blues away. Join the Prime Bill Fitness Clinic today. With everything you've described, then how many different jobs have you had? <laughs> so I started as Fred Johnny. Yes. And then uh, I became a nursing home administrator Mm -hmm. for both. You have geriatric for the elderly, and my last one was for pediatric. Okay. When I told my friends in the geriatric field that I was moving on to the pediatric, they said, Fred, Fred, don't. I said, why? You will cry. I said, why? I said, I've been used to crying. They call me turtle at home <laughs> because I cry a lot. But look at those kids. They're helpless. Mm-hmm. Look, they have, many of them are preemies, many of them. Okay. So they have a lot of disabilities, including the construction. I, I spent five years with that company. Mm-hmm. Look at those kids. And did you say somewhere in, in our conversation a tourism agency? As well, I was uh, with the Department of Tourism, tourism uh, of the Philippines okay. uh, for about, I think, seven years. That's where I met President Marcos and mm-hmm. Milda Marcos. Okay. Yeah. Do you do anything now, or do you consider yourself fully retired? I volunteer whenever there's an opportunity, like the landing was uh, um, a program initiated by the First Baptist Church to have a place every afternoon where kids who are not yet ready to go home because there's no one home, they would send them to the landing and I was part of that. Mm -hmm. And I I enjoy that. And the kids enjoy that and the parents and the church enjoy that. Well, we need to wrap it up. I have a feeling that Fred has lived a life that is full of way more stories than he told me today. But thank you for being on Nobody You Know. And if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you click the subscribe button and the like button and the little bell. I think those are all the things that YouTube wants me to tell you. (laughs) But uh, uh, And more importantly, if you want to be on the program, if you have something interesting about your life, if it's your job, your hobby, a life experience, I'd love to sit and talk with you. Obviously, on my current budget, you've got to be pretty close to Central Oregon, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, So thank you once again. I'm Brian Johnson. This is Nobody You Know, only now you do. Thank you.